each of you to our Good Friday evening service, a service that is being held in memory of the suffering and death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Often we think of the crucifixion and we think of the Roman soldiers who killed Jesus, who crucified him to the cross. We think of the Jewish leaders as the ones responsible for putting him there. But this evening I want to read two verses from John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. So we are gathered here this evening Yes, to remember the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, but it was Jesus who laid down his life for me and for you. This time I'll ask our chorister to come and lead us in a time of singing. Good evening. Um, would you please turn to me with, in the Christian hymnal to song number 311? <laughs> song number 311 at the cross. Did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ the mighty maker died, for man the creature sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. <clears throat> But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away, tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, 
and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. And song number 314. <clears throat> 314, all I need. Mm. Jesus Christ is made to me, all I need, all God, what a privilege it is to call you our Father, to be gathered together in this place this evening because of your love for us, your love that caused you to send your one and your only Son to come to this earth as a babe, to live a life, a perfect life, a life without sin, and then to lay that life down on the cross in our place so that we could have eternal life. Father, we pray your blessing upon us as we gather together. May you speak through your servant Myron. May the words that he speaks be the words that you would have each of us to hear, or anoint our ears to hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. If you care to, I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 22. <clears throat> Luke chapter 22. We're gathered together here tonight to partake in communion. Communion is a time to remember. Communion is a time to celebrate. 
And if you put those two words together, remember and celebrate, there's a word in our English language, uh, commemorate. We're here to commemorate, to remember with honor and respect and joy what Jesus Christ did for us. What exactly are we here to commemorate? What is it that we celebrate? What is it that we remember? What was it that the disciples remembered after this time together? I'm going to read quite a bit of scripture here tonight. If you care to follow along, you can do so, but you may just want to listen. And as I read, picture what is happening in your minds. This is the sort of the end of the story, or at least the latter part of the story, the account of what happened after Jesus' last meal with his disciples. And yet when they remembered, when they celebrated communion, when they did this in remembrance of him, I think these are the things that they remembered. These are the things that came to their mind. I'm going to start reading in verse 39 of Luke 22. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. <clears throat> he approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you are talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word that the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together. And Jesus was led before them. If you are the Christ, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. 
But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the Almighty God. They all asked, Are you then the Son of God? He replied, You are right in saying I am. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod. For he sent him back to us, as you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. With one voice they cried out, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. As they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also let out with them to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, There they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him, Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, 
We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. And we'll stop there. A time to remember. A time to celebrate. A time to commemorate. If you go back to verse 7 of Luke 22, Jesus institutes this time together with his disciples. Begin reading at verse 7, scripture says, Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. And say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished, make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This is not the first time that Jesus and his disciples had gotten together to observe the Passover. We don't find it recorded in Scripture, but scholars would tell us that very likely and almost certainly that Jesus would have gathered with his disciples before this, the last couple of years. Observe the Passover meal together. But this one was different. This one changed. Communion itself is celebrated by virtually every branch of Christianity. It has been celebrated for 2,000 years or more. It's a celebration of Jesus' sacrificial death, which means as we celebrate, as we commemorate here tonight, it is all about Grace. It's all about grace. This particular ceremony, communion that we're about to observe, is one that unites most of the time, and sometimes it actually divides. It expresses common faith in Jesus Christ, and in that way it unites us as believers. But there have been various aspects throughout history that have caused some controversy, caused some struggles, when to celebrate communion, when should that be done, how often should that be done, who should administer the emblems, who can take part in the emblems, what type of bread, what type of juice, how does all of that work. And as a result of that, many have lost sight of the central message that we're to remember, Jesus' sacrificial death for us. It's all about grace. 
Jesus instituted this as a way for his disciples and for us to remember. To remember that Jesus was with us. To remember that Jesus died for us. And to remember that Christ is now alive and working in us. This Lord's Supper, communion, was initiated during the Jewish Passover celebration. We find that in verse 15. They gather together to observe the Passover, the Passover meal. And that was to commemorate God's deliverance from slavery in Egypt. They had been there over 400 years. God raised up a leader in Moses. And through the plagues, Pharaoh finally let them go. They were to commemorate God's deliverance each and every year at that Passover celebration, that Passover meal. At this Passover meal, this celebration, Jesus changed that a bit. And he wanted his disciples to remember not only the Passover, but to remember his sacrificial death. And by his sacrificial death, the deliverance that we all have from the slavery of sin. At communion, we remember Christ's sacrificial death as deliverance from the slavery of sin. Romans 6, verse 6 and 7 says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. And Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent forth his spirit of his son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We remember our deliverance from the slavery of sin. Communion was also a time of blessing and of giving thanks. We find that in verse 17 and verse 19. He gave thanks. Time of giving thanks. Some call this the Eucharist. means thanksgiving. Communion reminds us of the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. Not only the deliverance from sin, but the blessings that we have. And there are many. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 8 through 10. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. In Ephesians 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We remember to give thanks. At the Passover meal, unleavened bread was broken. And Jesus tells them that it is going to symbolize at this meal when he broke the bread, his broken body, his body given for them. In the book of Exodus, the children of Israel were only to eat unleavened bread at that Passover meal. And during that time, all of the leaven was to be cleansed out of their houses. There was to be none. Everything, every bit of leaven had to be cleansed out of the house. And that's because leaven represents sin. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, we see that. Here at this Passover meal, Jesus broke that bread, symbolizing the sacrifice of his sinless life, his sinless body for us. Bread is a source of life and sustenance, and Jesus describes himself as the bread of life. In John chapter 6, verse 32 to 35. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. 
He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. We remember the broken body of Jesus Christ, that bread given for us. There was a cup of wine, several cups of wine, that were always shared at the Passover meal. The cup that Jesus shared with his disciples was to represent his blood. We find that in verse 20. But in that Passover meal, one of the cups of wine was called the cup of redemption. The cup of redemption. It was a reminder of the blood of the unblemished lamb that was sacrificed by each family before that Passover meal. The blood that they then put on the doorposts and over the mantle, representing the remembrance of when the death angel passed over the homes of those who had placed that blood there so many years before. The communion cup that we partake of tonight represents the blood of the Lamb of God. His blood sacrifice takes away the sin of the world. It preserves us from death and judgment, which we all deserve. It is a cup of redemption. We are redeemed. Ephesians 1.7 In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. <clears throat> and lastly, communion that Jesus instituted tells him that it's a symbol of a new covenant. He's starting something new. And he wants them to remember that. A covenant is a binding agreement between two parties. And throughout the Old Testament, those covenants were solemnized or made right with various seals and signs. Sometimes it was an animal that was sacrificed. Sometimes it was a recitation of a certain blessing or a certain cursing. Sometimes it was a, a special covenant meal or some type of memorial. In contrast to the Old Testament, contrast to the Old Testament covenant of works, Jesus institutes a new covenant, a new covenant that is unconditional and undeserved. It's a covenant of grace made possible by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And that's the covenant that we enjoy. That's the covenant that we live under. And we remember, we commemorate that covenant here tonight as we observe communion. It's a covenant that Jesus said is new. It is superior. It is better. It's not a law written on stones. It is a law written on the minds, written on the hearts. So we're here tonight to commemorate, to remember, to celebrate what Jesus did for us. And as we come tonight and as we partake of the bread and as we partake of the cup, let's remember and let's think what Jesus did for us. And as the cup of juice is handed to you, imagine Jesus saying to you, as he did to his disciples, this is the blood shed for you. And as the bread is handed to you, imagine Jesus saying to you, this is my body broken for you. Let's remember what Jesus did for us. Let's pray, shall we? Father, again, as we gather together here tonight to observe this communion celebration, we recognize, Father, that it is a covenant. It is a celebration. And we commemorate tonight, Jesus, what you did for us. And God, we're not here tonight because we're worthy. None of us are worthy. We're here tonight only by your grace. Only here by your sacrificial death. Only here by your broken body and your shed blood. Oh Lord, we gather here tonight to commemorate what you did for each and every one of us. To honor that sacrifice, to honor you, and to remember that it's all about grace. It's your love, it's your grace, it's your mercy that allows us to be here tonight. So God, we worship you, we praise you, and Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of being able to observe this here tonight. We pray this in your name. Amen.
John 13, verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that it, his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, "'Lord, do you wash my feet?' Jesus answered him, What I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my head and my hands. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean. But not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That, he w that is why he said, not all of you are clean. When he washed their feet and put, out, put on his outer garment and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you who do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. It is with joy that we have the privilege to commemorate the Lord's suffering, the institution of the, the Passover meal and also the institution of the communion service. To do this in remembrance of him so we would not forget. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12 says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. I'm glad we do not live in the Old Testament time where we had to, where they had to yearly take and sacrifice a lamb for their sins. Jesus Christ did that once and for all. So this evening we have the privilege to celebrate the institution of the Lord's Supper. If you are here this evening and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, we welcome you to join us in celebrating the Lord's Supper together. At this time, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll get ready for the communion service, and you can come up bench by bench, and the elderly sisters can wash feet on the room here.